invited uh, John David to, yes, to come back and visit uh, me and visit uh, Gut Sandsdorf. So <coughs> this was the opportunity. I decided to not make it public and not talk to the Sangha about it and to leave it completely open, <coughs> whether you wanted a meeting with other people or not. So it could have been also that we just met just privately. But I think this small number of members of the Sangha is just fine. And uh, this project of yours, uh, I think, is, is not just a simple book project, but it's much more than that. And some of you might have heard of this. Uh, there was an article also in the, in the <coughs> Visionen. I don't know who read that. So it's, it's like hidden material of Ramana has been found and published. So maybe you could, because as I say, it's not just a simple book, you know, it's much more than a book. And, and I understand that you <coughs> consider it to be, uh, well, maybe, maybe it's the most, the, rare project of book that you have done so far. I don't know. I, I guess so. Definitely. <clears throat> so it is, it is a difficult project in the sense, I understand, you know, that, that historically there are some questions about the material. And, <clears throat> you know, the historical context is always a big thing because you have to be very precise about the authenticity of the material and this kind of thing. So I think it would be of benefit for everybody, and I also have questions, if you could <coughs> present uh, not just the book, but present how this happened that you <laughs> uh, got this, got to have this material. I mean, there's a story behind it you have already told me some of it, but I think this is a really interesting thing. And just also talk about the, the difficulties and the question marks that are still there and so that we <coughs> have a good impression on this, this material. <coughs> and as far as I remember, you told me on the phone, you also had interaction with other teachers or was it David Godman? I can't remember. So you also had comments from different perspectives on this material, you know, so just just let us participate. Maybe I, I, I start a bit positive and if you want me, I can tell you a few nasty stories, but uh, maybe we <coughs> need it. But basically the ashram, um, well, let me start with myself. So two years ago, exactly, actually it was October 2021. I got an email from a friend from Lucknow, a satsang teacher from Lucknow, who's from America. And he told me about a manuscript. He said, there's a manuscript which you can download from Amazon for free. And you can still do that if you're interested. Um, <coughs> and this manuscript turned out to be more than a thousand pages, maybe one and a half thousand pages. And uh, I immediately downloaded it. And I don't really know what happened, but I was immediately, there was immediately something very strong happening. And uh, so it turned out that this material was completely unformatted. And it contained a lot of Sanskrit, and it also contained quite a lot of Tamil, because um, uh, Ramana was talking often in Tamil. So there's bits of Tamil and a lot of Sanskrit. And this whole huge manuscript was completely unformatted. It was almost like one long sentences for one and a half thousand pages. So it was almost unreadable. And, uh, but at the same time, there was some kind of amazing excitement. It was like some sort of energy happened. So um, I downloaded it and then um, started looking at it. And then, um, I don't really remember because it was two years ago, but I think I selected certain bits where I felt touched from what Bhagwan was telling. And uh, then I realized that I could cut out bits, cut and paste, and then I could start easily formatting it into 
because it's most of the most of the teachings are in dialogues. So there's it was quite easy to format it as a question and then Bagwa's <coughs> answer. And so I started doing that and actually I didn't stop for many months. I was sort of gripped in some very strong energy. And um, so the, it turned out later that the, the people who put <coughs> this manuscript up on, the, on Amazon had, had given this material to the ashram some two years before that, before it went public. And the ashram had decided not to publish it. And you mentioned David Godman. So David Godman had, had investigated it and apparently he'd been touched by some of the material, but he was very put off from the people who had put it up in the, on Amazon. He had some sort of personal contacts with them. He didn't like it and didn't trust them. And I suspect he was also influenced by the fact the ashram didn't want to publish it. Um, what yeah. kind of people are we talking about? Mysterious people. I, I, I mean, they live in Shanghai. It, it seemed to be an older man and a younger man. And we had all our email contact with the younger man. <coughs> But they would never allow us to meet them. Mm -hmm. And we had quite nice contact with them. And they even sent us some special presents. They sent us some original notebooks from the man who had written the diary. And um, containing parts of this manuscript. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah we, got a, we got maybe about 20 pages from the original notebook. And we published that in the back of this book. So everything we got, we put in the book. And these, these uh, pages we were sent were, in fact, not in the manuscript that was on Amazon. It was some extra material. So basically what happened is in 1936, a young man was brought by his family to visit Bagwan, and he, he himself apparently was completely not interested. But he came into the ashram, and some, some very profound thing must have happened between him and Bagwan, because then he wouldn't leave, and his parents left, and he stayed. So from July 1936 until the end of the year, so six months, He lived in the ashram and he regularly kept a diary of every day's goings on in the ashram and also all the dialogues that were happening in the ashram. <coughs> and it turned out that this was a very particular moment because if you look at this photograph, this is how Ramana Maharshi looked in 1936. So he was 50, 56 years old, not at all like we know him because we tend to know him you know with a lot of white hair and an old white beard and not walking very well and so this man was completely different so in 1936 he was the main cook of the ashram and he, at that time they started to build the ashram we can see today out of stone buildings and he was the architect and organizer of the construction so he was pretty active in those days But he was also sitting in a room, in the, being available. So anybody who visited, he was available. And it turned out that one or two years before, there was a man you probably heard of called Paul Brunton, who had visited India looking for a guru, and traveled around looking for a guru, wrote a book about it. And he had gone all around and didn't find any guru. And he was in Bombay ready to leave and come back to Europe. <coughs> when he got a message to, you must go and see Ramana Maharshi. And so he went to see Ramana Maharshi and he was completely touched. And so he, in his book, Secret India, he, he gave a very glowing report about Ramana Maharshi. That was in, I think, 1934. So two years later in 1936, which just happens to be the moment this young man was there, um, Later, he became a lawyer, and it seems he was very well educated, and his writing is pretty, pretty <coughs> impressive. 
And um, so in 1936, there was quite a big flow <coughs> of Western people coming to India and coming to Ramana Maharshi out of this book, which you know, encouraged people to come. <coughs> but also in Pondicherry, you probably know there was another Indian guru uh, whose name I've forgotten. But you mean Sri Aurobindo? Yeah, Aurobindo. So many people also came to Pondicherry to Aurobindo, and then they also came to visit Ramana Maharshi. And at that time, also in uh, Shanghai, there was um, a Theosophical Society. And so people also came there. So there was somehow a lot of Westerners coming at that time. And so uh, actually most of these dialogues that I, we, we selected and put in this book are dialogues with, not all, but many of them are dialogues with Western seekers who had put a tremendous effort to get themselves to India and to to come and dialogue with Ramana Maharshi. <coughs> and so as I was selecting things, I personally was very touched because somehow, whatever the contra controversy about whether this material is really historically from Ramana or, or somebody else, <coughs> I personally never had a doubt. So we did things like um, go to the university and get the notebook pages checked and such things. But basically for me, myself personally, for some strange reason, I never had any question. Because when I read these teachings, they so deeply touched me that, well, it, I didn't need to be, have any proof. And it was just, when I read them, they touched me <coughs> deeply. And because I like a bit mystical things, I can say that many late nights, because probably for six months, I was constantly working on this material. So very often late at night, it almost felt like I was in the ashram. So many times I felt I was completely guided by Ramana Maharshi himself which is not exactly historical proof, of course. <coughs> and there were many other strange things that happened along the way. I remember maybe after six months going to Tiru, uh, going to the ashram, talking to um, the last president's brother who was running the ashram at the time. And he got very angry with me and threw me out of his office. And um, so that made me think, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't publish this material. <coughs> and then a young man who I knew came to one of my meetings and told me about a Swami. And I went to visit this Swami, and this Swami ended up writing the foreword to this book. And it turned out that he had, when he was a young man, he'd been living with Animalai Swami, who you may know was a close devotee of, of Ramana. He was, in fact, the one who built the ashram, who was the manager of building the ashram. And this man that I went to see, this Swami, who's now probably 70 years old or something, he, when he was a young man, had lived with Animalai Swami. Animalai Swami had a very tiny ashram. You can visit this ashram. It's at the back of Ramana Ashram. And he lived in this very tiny room. And while he was there, um, Animalai Swami told him sort of his whole life story with, with Ramana Maharshi. So when I went to visit this Swami, I mean, he told me also some of these stories. And it turned out that he'd also been living in Ramana Ashram. And he had been looking after some of the old disciples. And he also had worked in the publications department of Ramana Ashram. By that time, I'd already got quite a pile of, you could call them chapters or dialogues. And at that time, I was really wondering if I should publish them or not, because Ashram were very angry with me, and I, you know, I, I didn't really quite know what to do. So I gave a pile of these to this Swami, and I said, could you read through this and give me your opinion? And he told me, after about a week, he told me that this is wonderful material. This is the treasure. You don't just publish one book. You have to publish the whole thing. It would be about six books. 
I don't think we'll manage that, but we started working on a second volume. And um, so... Before you continue, let me just ask this. Yeah. I mean, you, you made a remark when we were talking on the phone, but why exactly does the management of the ashram get extremely angry when you are publishing this material? Well, you'd have to ask them. I yeah. mean, this year in January, they have a new president now who was a doctor <coughs> in America. I went to visit him. I gave him a copy of the book. And I went back, I think, I think the first meeting was quite friendly, kind of polite. And then the next day I went back to perhaps get a little bit more impressions of him reading the book. And he got extremely angry with me and he got the manager of the ashram. and they both screamed at me and threw me out of the office. So why they're acting like that, I can't tell you. You'd mm. have to find mm. out from them. Mm. I mean, yes. I might have some ideas, but I don't think I need to <coughs> express them. Well, I, I, I find myself reminded, you know, to a different story we have been sharing, uh, yes, maybe then 10 years ago. Uh, it's, it was about... <clears throat> um, let me just think. Yes, it was about uh, a book of, um, I think, David Godman about Ramana, where the <clears throat> um, management of the ashram, they had intervened. Right. And they, they didn't want certain material to be published because <clears throat> it was, well, to Not their so understanding, giving a, a wrong <clears throat> or something they didn't want to be published about Ramana. You know, it were, it were, of course, it were stories about anger, you know, Ramana getting angry and <clears throat> uh, some of his devotees in the daily life had, were frightened of him. This is a whole image which was not absolutely unknown to the public. So. These pages, I think we were dealing with about 12 pages of, of David Godman's book. Um, <clears throat> they <clears throat> said, you cannot publish this to him, right? Is that, is that is my think, memory correct? Yeah, I think it was a few more pages. Even I mean, more. He, he had published it, <coughs> he had published the whole book himself, mm. and then the ashram had read it, and they had then called him in. I mean, David Godman is an interesting character because <coughs> He's more or less been part of the ashram for, I don't know, about 40 years now, I think. And his own story is quite interesting. And he's published some wonderful books about Ramana and the disciples of Ramana. And, you know, actually he was a bit of my, a bit of a hero for me. So I think in your bookshop, you've got a book from me called Aranachala Shiva, where I interviewed him. And, and we did this book a bit together. But at the time when I finally published it, David got very upset with me, so uh, we're not friends anymore. Why? Well, this is not interesting right no, now, but, but I mean, I, I find it interesting, let's say this in a neutral way at the moment, you know, that what, what is the interest of the ashram management, you know? The interest should be to not intervene and, <coughs> and allow the authenticity of teachings and stories that, that embed the teaching to be published. You know, well, so I this agree, seems I not agree. to be happening. Well, just recently, for example, I haven't been there since, uh, <coughs> well, I'll be going soon, but I haven't been for some months. Apparently, this new president has banned a man who has been regularly invited to give a series of lectures every year around Bhagwan's birthday. He's supposed to be an incredible teacher. I haven't met him, I haven't heard what he says, but I, he's apparently an amazing teacher. And he's been invited into the ashram by Ganeshan. Maybe you know Ganeshan, he's one of the three original brothers who's been running the ashram for many years. He was the editor of Mountain Path for many years and somebody I got to know quite well. So he, in, he found, I don't know if he found him, but anyway, he was uh, inviting him into the ashram every year for, I don't know how many years, quite a few years. And this man had got a huge following. 
Um, and this year he's been banned or been told he's not welcome to give his lectures this year. So this is from the new president, and I don't know anything about it really, but apparently a lot of people are very upset about that. I mean, one of the things when, when, when we decided to select for this book, Basically, in the beginning, I only really worked on the teachings. So all these dialogues where Western people came and they had a, a dialogue, um, we only chose those dialogues. But then reading more into the manuscript, there's some amazingly wonderful stories about the daily life of the ashram. And in these stories, very often, there would be a kind of practical teaching, you could say, from, from Ramana. So then we selected some of the less controversial stories, and they are also in this book. But in volume two, I'm planning to put the more controversial stories, because the ashram have made me pretty pissed off. And, and as I say, my, my, my own feeling is that I'm somehow guided to do this project. Why that is, I don't know, but uh, I don't have any doubts. And I didn't have any doubts from the very first moment. And it, it's hard to explain, but as I say, there was a sort of energy that guided me to this Swami, for example. And then he has written the Ford, and in this Ford, he's written that this material is a treasure. And I would also say it's a treasure. But of course, it's this historical material from 1936. Um, there's not much known about this young man. Uh, he was there from July through to uh, December, and then his family were getting worried, so they arranged a wife for him, and then he left, and um, they probably got married, and then he, I think he started to be a lawyer, and nobody knows anything about him. So there's no historical proof, if you like, that the material is authentic. And I mean, if this story touches you, I can only suggest you have a look at the book, read the teachings, and see if they also touch you. And these two men, you were talking about strange people in Chennai. Yeah, yeah. How did they receive this material? Uh, this old man and the young man. Well, this is an, this is an unclear story. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why David Goldman got it. Um, um, suspicious, maybe. Yeah. I'm less suspicious, I think, than, than he is. Mm. So um, I put a photograph in the introduction of a young woman who, to my way of looking at her photo, is a very innocent young Indian woman. And it's here in the book. Mm -hmm. And this young woman typed up this whole huge manuscript. Where this whole manuscript came from, I, it's a mystery. Nobody seems to know. But when I saw this photo of this woman, I had more trust that this older man and the younger man, um, in their own strange way, are authentic. Mm. And they definitely had some original uh, pages of the notebook. <coughs> and they had sent 20 of these pages to the ashram with the whole manuscript two years before I heard about it. But the ashram, uh, well, I asked the ashram if they'd give me these 20 pages to copy so I could also publish them. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want, mm -hmm. didn't want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recently, the, we had a very interesting review from uh, a spiritual teacher from the States who's written actually two very nice reviews. You can see them on Amazon. And in one of them, he said, it's a bit like finding a new play from Shakespeare. So I was rather pleased with that review, of course. So, I mean, Good. maybe I go on a bit. Um, so this title here, Aham Sparana, maybe this is the most interesting aspect of the teachings in this book. <coughs> we call it Aham Sparana and we translate it as a glimpse of self-realization. So 
if you'd like, I could read a paragraph where he's talking, uh, Bagman himself is talking about Ahamsparana. You, maybe you recognize this, many of you. So Bagwan says, having reached Ahamsparana, no further effort is possible. For one who has reached Sparana, which means a pulsation, this question is impossible, as in any other question. No doubts arise because the doubter has long ago given himself up to the infinite beingness that shines in his own heart as the light of the true I. One who has reached Parana and remains perpetually merged in it, instead of being unsettled, would never think I have reached the Ahamsparana. Now I wonder when realization of the absolute self is going to dawn on me, nor would he, th he think any other thought. The thinker gone, who is left to manufacture thoughts? The one who steadfastly remains in the Sparana state does not crave realization, <coughs> nor anything else. For he no more has any needs. Since a fall from it is always theoretically possible, the Sparana is still classified as a spiritual practice. However, it is the loftiest stage of practice, for it is sustained without the least trace of effort or will to remain in it. Continuous barana is possible only after the ego sense has been finally given up. So I'm sure many of you know this state of Sparana. Yes, thank you for sharing this uh, and the, the whole project. I mean, um, I can, we can expect more, right? I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody would like to make a comment or have, have a question on, the, on this book project, on this Ramana material? Yeah, I would like to ask, because you were mentioning that you have some ideas about why the ashram might have, the management might have rejected the material. Whether you are going to share your, your thoughts. Is it, is it in the same direction as... Well, I mean, the, the ashram, when, when Bhagwan was alive, the manager of the ashram was his brother. So in, the, in this diary, there's quite a few situations. Uh, for example, there was one situation where the manager decided, his brother decided, uh, to get rat poison Sabine, yeah, and amazing. kill the rats. Sabine? And when Ramana heard about this, he called his brother and told him, uh, get lots of rat poison because I'll be the first rat. So it's those okay. kind of stories don't exactly show um, that there was a good connection between the manager and, and, and Bagwan, even though it was his brother. And the present president is the uh, descendant of that same manager. So, you know, it, the ashram is run as a family business and they've created over the years a very clear image of a man mostly sitting on a couch, feeding squirrels, smiling a lot. Friendly, when as, peaceful, huh? peaceful, friendly. Friendly kind of grandfather. And of course, as Ohm was just saying, he wasn't always like that. So in this book, which I think you have copies, Ar Aranach the Shiva, when I interviewed David Godman, who was, I consider a bit of an authority, he was um, telling that many people were completely afraid of Ramana and they couldn't even talk to him, they couldn't really ask him a question. 
And often when people did ask him a question, he didn't really answer them. So he was a kind of strong figure and some people felt fear about him. <coughs> and also there are stories that David told me where he did, as you say, he got angry. And that didn't fit the ashram's cultivated image of Ramana. If you, if you have some image yourself of him, you would never imagine he could get angry. So that didn't fit the ashram's kind of choice of image, you could say. But I'm sure Om knows that sometimes he gets angry, and I definitely get angry. And um, I mean, if you're a teacher, you can't help but get angry sometimes. <coughs> Do you get angry sometimes? <laughs> I don't think he well, does. Yeah, <coughs> <Never gets angry. coughs> no. But you know, you only have to look at the pictures of Ramana. And if you go to the ashram, there are many, many pictures. He often looks very sour, actually. But the images that are published, of course, are not those pictures. <coughs> that you are here with us and that are, when I listen to you when you are reading Ramana so thank you very much for sharing thank you I yeah. can, I can just feel it doesn't feel it, it never f has really felt personal I mean a tremendous amount of work went into this book I can't even explain and it wasn't just John David it was a whole team of people from our community who were equally touched and uh, there was one moment where we had gone to Sri Lanka and rented a house for six weeks. And actually we produced this book and another book. So we actually have a second volume well on its way. Um, so tremendous energy has gone into producing this. And also we had wonderful, um, for example, with all this Tamil, we needed to find somebody who would translate it for us. And so I can't even remember how we found this man, but we found a man who himself has published, uh, I think he says, 90 books in Tamil, spiritual books. Quite an old man in his 70s. And he worked for almost a year translating bits of Tamil for us and helping us with the Sanskrit. So we, we have many things, if you like, who've supported this project. Sorry? To publish more than two books, what support do you need? In yeah, it's a, it's a big job. I mean, it, life is very strange. To be honest, we, we haven't really got much of a response from America, from the States, for whatever reason, I don't know. We had a, not a very active distributor of the books, I think. But for some reason, it's changed recently. And as I said, there was one teacher who wrote two reviews, one of which said this is like uh, finding a Shakespeare, a new Shakespeare play. So that's very positive. And since he wrote that, um, Amazon ordered 50 copies just recently. So I think it's going to change. And only two days ago, I got an email from somebody in the States asking me, is there another volume already? So there may become a pressure to do more volumes, but at the moment I'm not rushing to do that, so, um, it's a lot of work. Mm Uh, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> I've only lived 22 years in Germany, but it's not my strong point. So I'm just asking um, how you proceed to um, with this material now, with the, with the volumes coming or with the work coming. How do you 
select the material? Do you work by themes or do you have any structure along which you work regarding this amount of material? No, no structure, no. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, as I say, there is some, some power that wants this material published, you know. And I see myself only as a sort of instrument. I mean, I don't talk too much about it, but there's been many instances where, for example, when I went to, to visit this Swami, who's been very much supportive and who's written the foreword and who says it's a treasure. When I went to visit him the first time, I never met this Swami. I didn't know if I could trust this Swami. And when I arrived in his ashram, he has an ashram which looks after the, the medical needs of sadhus who come to Tiru, who come to Aranachala. And I immediately liked him as a human being, but I didn't know if I can really trust him. And he took me immediately upstairs where they had their meditation room, and he had a statue of, of Ramana. And I immediately fell in love with this statue. It was a completely <coughs> beautiful statue. I mean, I could even say it's slightly better than the one they have in the ashram. And he told me the story about how this um, statue had come to him. So the daughter of the man who'd made the statue had just suddenly given it to him. He'd gone to Bombay and suddenly this woman appeared and said, I want to give you this statue. And it was a beautiful statue. So when I saw this statue and I saw the love in which they had put flowers and uh, incense and every morning they made a special puja with this statue, that immediately gave me a confidence about this Swami. So those are my technique, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.